1844. Living in New York at the time, the class went to the Empire State Building. At the time, it was the tallest building in all the world, piercing the sky 1,250 feet. And as a fourth grader, Tony, he stepped onto the observation deck and it was like the world stopped spinning. He was no longer distracted by all the hubbub of New York City. And he explained to his students, this is what he said. He said, in one mystical, magical moment, I took in the city. And if I live a million years, that moment will still be a part of my consciousness because I was fully alive when I lived it. You see, Dr. Campolo, he speaks of uh, being mystical and magical, but what he really means is that uh, he speaks of a time when he was fully present void of any distractions, able to view the city that he loved. And having shared his experience with the entire class, Dr. Campolo turned back to the student in the front row and asked again, how long have you lived? The young man grew restless in his seat, as you can imagine. He was confronted with the fact that he hadn't truly lived, but had been distracted by all the competing noise in his life. He said, well, when you say it that way, maybe an hour. Maybe a minute. Or maybe... You see, distractions, when we solely focus on the motions and the mechanics of life, they have a way of distracting us. They have a way of of stealing, not in any sort of salvific sense, but distracting us from the abundant spiritual life offered to us by Jesus Christ. And there's no doubt that that's true of our spiritual lives of of being distracted. Christ, he gives us the abundant life. And without much effort, we can live distracted by the motions and mechanics of life. I ask you this morning, as I think about my own spiritual life and my own distractions, I ask you this morning, is your spiritual life distracted by something? More specifically, does serving Christ ever get in the way of your devotion to Him? Think about that for a second. Does serving Christ ever get in the way of your devotion to Him? Or, or maybe uh, you're distracted in a different way. Maybe the things that worry you or, or bother you. There are a lot of worrisome and bothersome things going on in this world that can distract us from a vibrant spiritual life. And in the sake of serving Christ, we can be distracted by our service. You know, we've got Bible studies to put together. We've got the Word to study. We've got prayer to do. We've got fellowship to do. We've got Sundays to come about. We've got worship services to plan. We've got communion to plan. We've got all of these spiritual things that we do. And I think that there are times in our spiritual lives where sometimes our service to God distracts us from God. You'll see here in a second. This morning we are going to be innocent bystanders to a distracted disciple. In Luke chapter 10, we're going to see that busyness and anxiety can lead to be lead to distracted discipleship and how we can make communion with Christ 
the springboard to serving Christ. Again, we're going to see that busyness and anxiety can lead to distracted discipleship. And finally, how we can make communion with Christ the springboard to serving Christ. Distracted discipleship. Busyness and anxiety can lead to distracted discipleship. If you have your Bible, meet me in Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 38 through 42 this morning. And again, as you already heard me mention, we're innocent bystanders to a sisterly quarrel. And if I don't have any sisters, and so this is my only context for a sisterly quarrel, and it's not good. There is some strife between these two sisters, and it's a place I don't ever want to find myself in. A quarrel between two sisters. And it just so happens that Jesus is drug into this quarrel between the two sisters. Jesus, he's just sent out the 70 disciples, and they have had tremendous success. Even the demons uh, abide by their ministry and what they command them to do. They've had tremendous success. Jesus has shared with them the story of the Good Samaritan. And now Jesus and the disciples continue traveling until they come to a certain village. And we pick up the story there in Luke chapter 10. Verses 38 through 42. If you have something to write with, have it handy. I'm going to point out some things that you might want to underline or circle. Verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, he, Jesus, entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha, catch that, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations. Would you circle distracted, mark it some way, highlight it, whatever it is that you do to denote things? But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do it all by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. Would you circle or underline worried or bothered? Maybe, maybe your version says anxiety or something like that. Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. We see in this passage how busyness and anxiety can lead to to distracted discipleship. But before we get to to that, I want to point out a couple of scandalous things in this passage that, that perhaps you've overlooked like I had throughout the years. Culturally, this is scandalous that a young single woman would let a young single man into her home. Even in our most permissive culture today, it's kind of frowned upon, right? It makes us uncomfortable. I don't have a daughter, but if I did, I would be weary if she let a young man into her home that she didn't know. But yet Martha invites this young man, Jesus, into her home. And culturally, that was a no-no. A little bit of scandal here. Martha, she invites Jesus in. We know that Martha's doing her thing. We were introduced to Mary who sits at Jesus' feet. And it's interesting to me that Mary never says anything. She doesn't have to. But there's also a little bit of scandal in that Jesus went into the home of this young woman. Had he never heard of the Billy Graham rule? Martha invites Jesus in. Mary sits at the feet of Jesus, and Martha was busy. She was distracted by all the preparation of Jesus being there. By all intents and purposes, Martha was doing uh, nine times out of ten a good thing. Hospitality was Martha's spiritual gift, it's obvious. 
She wanted to create a warm and welcoming environment for, for Jesus. She wanted him to come into her home and, and to feel comfortable. This man is a guest in her home, and, and Martha is being a busybody doing what she likely knows to do, and that's to make people comfortable. But Martha missed the forest for the trees. She had an opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus just as Mary did, and she chose to be busy instead. And again, being busy is not bad in and of itself, but when that busyness becomes a distraction to Jesus Christ, it is none other than distracted discipleship. And as I think about Martha, I think we have the same problem that she does. We are a busy people. I have the great privilege of being able to be connected to many of you and spend time with many of you. And I have not had a single person come to me and say, you know, Sage, I just don't have any time to do any. I, or I have plenty of time. If there's ever anything you need done, just call me. I've never had anyone say, I've just got oodles and gobs of time. I'm just twiddling my thumbs. Give me a holler. Everybody I talk to is busy. We're traveling. We're going to see friends. We're spending time with family. We're, we're going out. We're raising our kids. We're working hard. We're, we're doing all of these great and wonderful things, but sometimes those things are at the expense of our devotion to Jesus Christ. And that's what we see in Mary, or Martha. And again, Martha was doing good things, but at the expense of devotion to Jesus. Martha, she wasn't twiddling her thumbs. She was working hard to make Jesus comfortable. I think about a time in my life where... I was a distracted disciple or had the most potential to be. And it's interesting to me that this chapter of my life would be that time. It was during seminary. And maybe Brother Roy could feel the exact same way we were sharing uh, war stories from seminary this morning. But you go to seminary. It's graduate school. There's a certain expectation for academics. Uh, they give you assignments, and those things have to be completed. And it is very often the case that seminary is either a very fulfilling time or it is a time where your spiritual life just gets sucked from you because you get caught up in checking things off the list and it just becomes an academic exercise. It just becomes something that you check off the list. And it's very easy for those assignments that we get to just be checkmarked. Okay, I got to do it, but what's interesting and what's beautiful about seminary is that those assignments were given to us to enrich our spiritual lives, not take from them. But it was a time of busyness for me. And if I wasn't super vigilant about my spiritual life and making sure that these exercises that I was doing in academics weren't enriching to me, they were drawing from me and drying me up spiritually. And I wonder if there aren't some things that are drying you up spiritually, that are distracting you from your spiritual life. It's so easy to get preoccupied with spiritual things and, and lose sight of Christ, whether it be doing our Bible study because we know it's what we have to do or, or prayer time because we know it's what we have to do or coming to church because we know it's what we have to do or teaching Sunday school or preaching a sermon or, or singing a song. We can totally lose sight of Jesus Christ in our preparation. Am I the only one? It is so easy to get distracted from our devotion to Christ. And that's exactly what happened to Martha. She was busy at the expense of her devotion to Christ. Apart from drifting apart from Christ in relationship, not in salvation... There are some other real dangers to distraction, dangers of distracted discipleship. Ministry becomes less fulfilling. I hope that you've never experienced a time where you've been serving in ministry in some capacity and it was not fulfilling. That's a difficult time. It's difficult. 
Another danger of distracted discipleship is that your spiritual life, it just dries up like a barren well. Another danger is that you burn out. I'm convinced that most pastors burn out and that most people burn out from ministry is because they operate outside of their giftedness for long periods of time. That's why I've been so vigilant about communicating about spiritual gifts. That's why we talked about spiritual gifts in the new member class so much. And why when you come across my office and we're talking about ministry, and I ask you about what your spiritual gifts are because we care about your spiritual well-being. And if you serve for an extended period of time in a place where you're not gifted, it's inevitable you're going to burn out. Distracted discipleship can lead to burn. And the last distraction, danger of distraction, is that you can attempt to muscle your way through ministry. You've heard me say that before. I remember hauling hay as a, as a young boy, and, and, and uh, Dad would just say, of course, we had little short trailers, so the shorter the trailer, the higher you had to go with the hay, it seemed like. And he would say, just muscle it up there. Just muscle it up there. And I've been known to, to muscle my way through life a time or two. And sometimes we can muscle our way through ministry, keeping Jesus out of the equation and doing our own thing. But not only was Martha busy, she was busy because of her anxiety. Don't miss this. Martha was busy due to her anxiety. Look back at verse 41. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, he doesn't say you're busy. He says you're worried and you're bothered about so many things. So many things. The root of her busyness wasn't that she was a busybody per se. It was the outflow of her anxiety and worry in her life. She was distracted because she was worried and bothered by so many things. I don't know about you, but if I were to guess, there is something in your life that causes you a little anxiety. Maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a rough marriage. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's home. It could be any number of things that are real and tangible and hurtful and deep and traumatic. Anxiety is real. And we see the effects of unprocessed and undealt with anxiety here. Unprocessed anxiety leads to spiritual discipleship distraction. That's why we need a good friend who's, who's got some wise counsel, who's godly, who's loving, who can listen, who can extend some reproof or correction. Or That's why we need people to surround us and support us, whether it be through small group or celebrate recovery or friends at work or through church family. It's why we need to be here together to encourage and edify one another because anxiety is real. And it has a way of stifling our spiritual life. And if you don't think it will, look at Martha. And it will affect you and it will affect everyone around you and it will affect this church if left untapped, unprocessed. We have some counselors here at the church if you're interested. I would love to chat and pray with you and help you in some way. Perhaps Celebrate Recovery might be helpful in addition to other things. Maybe seeing a doctor would be helpful in helping you process the anxiety that you might have. But these are tools and resources that God has given us to help us process anxiety because when we don't, we become Martha. We become distracted by preparation, by busyness, by any other thing that you can imagine that distracts you from Jesus. 
I think it's so interesting here that uh, Jesus says that she's worried about so many things. We learn another important fact about anxiety. If left alone, it accumulates. It may start on one thing, but it has a snowball effect. What starts out as one anxiety or one worry or one burden that you have, it continues to snowball out until it's unmanageable and then you really need help. Our worries, our anxiety, they can distract us from devotion to Christ, but so can the things that bother us. Obviously, we just got back from vacation and we drove. We left our house and drove to Laramie, Wyoming in a day. That's a thousand miles. And then we drove from Laramie to Pondale and stayed. And then on our anniversary, the 18th, we went to Salt Lake City and we came back. And then we went to Santa Fe on the way home. We did some traveling. And every fuel pump I stopped at bothered me. Okay? (laughs) I don't mean to make a political statement. Lord, forgive me. It just bothered me. Because as a normal citizen, maybe I'm normal, or maybe I'm abnormal, I don't know. A citizen nonetheless. It just seems so easily fixable. But I digress. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Really? (laughs) It's true. But I found that when I got in that car and I drove away from that fuel pump, it still bothered me. Was I going to let that bothering fuel, fuel prices that I can do nothing about but vote, was I going to let that hinder my trip with my bride? Sometimes it does. You see, the things that bother us in life, whether it be denominations, theological, hills to die on, politics, Whatever the case may be, sometimes the things that bother us distract us from devotion to Christ. And I know I'm not the only one that needs to hear that this morning because it's true. Our anxieties, the things that bother us, busyness distracts us from sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. I love how uh, Jesus speaks to Martha knowing what he knows. Again, verse uh, 41. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. What an incredible reaction to Jesus. But look back up in verse 40. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me serving to do all the work? Then tell her to stop. She drags Jesus right into the middle of this. Martha's being a little demanding, if you ask me. Martha, she calls into question Jesus' care for her. She asks a leading question. Do you not care about me? If Jesus answers no to the rest of that question, Martha's feelings are going to get hurt because she asked a leading question. But Jesus knows it's a trap. He answers graciously. Martha, she calls into question Jesus' care for her. She's concerned about being left alone to do all the work. She's basically saying, Jesus, do you not care that this isn't fair? I'm over here working my tail off over a hot stove. And if she was in Arkansas, she'd have been barefoot and pregnant. That's where I'm from, Arkansas. I can say that. That was a joke. Yeah, I know. She says, this isn't fair. Why am I doing all the work? Listen, if fairness is what she's after, she's only going to get that in the presence of Jesus. But to make matters worse, she demands that Jesus speak to her. He said, she says, tell her to help me. Could you imagine talking to Jesus that way? I have. Have you? 
We've all been there. We can't cause up too much fuss about Martha because in Martha is every one of us. To say that Martha is upset with Mary is a vast understatement. And Jesus in his infinite wisdom, he sees through all that and he gets to the very root of the problem. Martha is anxious about so many things because like anxiety, it starts off at one point and it continues to snowball out of control. His concern is distracted discipleship. And he graciously pulls her back into reality by encouraging her to focus on one thing rather than many things. We deceive ourselves to think that we can juggle a bunch of different things in life. You might can keep them in the air, but you can't keep it going forever and you can't get the balls very high. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. Jesus pulls her back into reality because she is a distracted disciple, worried about so many things when there is only one thing. There's a verse that I often share when counseling with people. Um, We have people come through here. Sometimes I meet with them once. Sometimes I meet with them for a year. And one of the first verses I ask each and every person to memorize if they're struggling with anxiety or depression or or various other things is Philippians 4.8. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That's the one thing. But when anxiety takes over, when we're in the throes of anxiety, we think about so many things. And we're distracted by them. By the grace of God, many of you are dealing with some anxiety right now. And you're able to run to Jesus, thankfully. You've lived enough life. Maybe you've hit rock bottom. Maybe you're at a place in your life where you are so anxious that there was no other route to take but into the arms of Jesus. Praise God for that. You're in a safe place. That's why we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. We get to run to the arms of the Father. And for the rest of us, maybe we haven't hit rock bottom yet and we continue to struggle with anxiety and busyness and all of these things that that distract us from our spiritual life. But the good news is, is that Martha could then come sit at the feet of Jesus. We're not told the rest of the story. And so this is the Sage Pruitt version and it is not uh, in any way inspired. But I kind of like to think that Martha came after Jesus said that to her that she came and she sat at the feet of Jesus. So no matter where you are in your spiritual life, whether you are gripped by anxiety and distraction, our Father welcomes you home. He welcomes you back. He welcomes you into His presence. And so my challenge for you as busyness and anxiety can lead to distracted discipleship is that we would make communion with Christ the first step. That we would make communion with Christ the springboard to serving Christ. Martha's problem, she got them mixed up. She got her cart before her horse, as William Pruitt would say. But Mary got it right. She made communion with Christ her number one priority. And out of communion to Christ comes service to Christ. That's how it's got to be. As I think about Mary and and kind of the, the cultural scandal at play here that a woman would sit at the feet of Jesus. You see, a, a woman could never sit at the feet of a rabbi. That's why this Jesus is is so vastly different from all these religious leaders we we have in the Gospels. Jesus allowed this young woman to sit at her feet, kind of an intimate thing, not in any any sort of sexual way, but to sit at the feet of a teacher one-to-one was this beautiful thing, and Mary got to do that. And it shows to us that God is knowable, that God is approachable, and that he's worthy of our attention. Again, no matter where you are this morning, maybe you're distracted, maybe you're not. 
But the truth is, is that we can have communion with Christ. We don't have to be a distracted disciple. Being busy doing sometimes very spiritual things that are empty. So you might be thinking, well, how can I have communion with him? Maybe, uh, maybe you feel distracted and you feel distant uh, from Jesus Christ. I want to give you uh, one abstract thought and then some tangible ones following that. I think the easiest way to have communion with Jesus Christ is to simply love him. And that's a big abstract term and it gets thrown around so much. But thankfully in the Gospel of Matthew, he gives us some tangible uh, ways to love God. He says to love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you love him by knowing him. As Catherine and I celebrated uh, our anniversary, I couldn't help but think of all the ways that I love her. That I wouldn't have ever known had I not married her six years ago. Six years ago. (laughs) It's a joy and a privilege to have a relationship with people we love. And the more that we get to know them, the more we behold their beauty. And the same it is with Jesus. The more we know him, the more we fall in love with him. And that love becomes the springboard of service, not the other way around. We know him through his word by intentionally taking time to study it and read it and to find out more about who this Jesus is. We love him by knowing more of his spirit as his spirit indwells believers We know more of him by being around his people. It's interesting to me that love has a way of of getting us into gear. Um, Maybe you have a friend, maybe you have a spouse, maybe you have a family member that you love deeply, and they could call you in the middle of the night and you would do anything for them because you love them. And that's the sort of communion we can have with Christ who is knowable, who is approachable, who's worthy of our attention. You might be thinking, well, how in the world can I tell if I'm communing with Christ? That seems like a reasonable question. How can I know if I'm communing with Christ? I think one of the greatest tests of whether or not we're distracted or whether or not we're communing with Christ, is if whether or not we're being obedient to him. The things that he's calling us to do, the way that he's calling us to live, of course out of love, not out of legalism, out of love and devotion to him. He says in John chapter 14, verse 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The good news is this, is that when we fail to keep his commandments, like Martha He welcomes us back to his feet to sit and learn from the master because he's good and gracious and kind. I don't know uh, if if maybe you're wrestling with a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Uh, Maybe it hasn't been on your mind until this morning. Uh, The good news is, is that we were born into this world separated from God because of a thing called sin. And no matter what we do, we could not rectify that problem. We could not fix it. Under no circumstances could we fix it on our own. But the good news is this, is that Jesus Christ has offered us a gift, an eternal life. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he gives us this eternal life. That we can sit at his feet and be loved and cared for time and time and time. If you would like to learn more about what it means to truly commune with Jesus Christ by first having a relationship with him or being in a relationship with him, would love to chat with you about that. So please don't hesitate to reach out. But it's no coincidence this morning that as we talk about communion and as we talk about communion with Christ being the springboard uh, to serving Christ, we're actually going to take communion together this morning. So I'm going to ask Dave to come 
uh, get ready to play. I'm going to invite you this morning that if you are a child of God, we're going to invite you to take part in this communion. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're going to ask you to refrain. We believe that communion is for the family of God. It's not in any sort of judgmental way. No one's going to look at you uh, wrongly. Uh, Just please just abstain from this. And if you have any questions, we would love to chat with you about that. So here in a moment, um, each of you are going to have an opportunity to take a small bit of juice and a wafer. And I want you to know that this is a a very precious time. And the point of this ordinance is for us to reflect on the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to bless both elements here in a moment, the the juice and the wafer. And then Terry and and Roy are going to pass those out here in a second. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to take these elements on your own. We're going to take them here together this morning. But maybe you need an extra moment to, to pray or thank God for something or, or, or do something spiritually in the moment. So I'm going to ask that you take the elements on your own. Take it immediately if you feel led or take a moment to reflect on what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. We're going to take the cup in remembrance of his sacrifice. We're going to eat the bread in remembrance of his body. And it's important that we come to the Lord's table with table manners, as I've said before. That we come to the communion table having examined ourselves. So I'm going to ask you here in just a few moments to spend a few moments to personally examine yourselves. That we would examine our attitudes towards God, that we would examine our attitude towards others. And maybe you need to go across the room or pull somebody aside or speak to someone and ask for forgiveness from someone or from God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, just just take a few moments to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we join together this morning as a unified body of believers, individuals who are united by same mind and judgment. And Lord, we ask for help in our focus of your son, Jesus. Some of us may be may have walked in the doors this morning, distracted disciples. And this may be our first opportunity to reorient ourselves to communion with you. And so, Lord, we pray that the rest of our time together would be focused on our Savior, sweet Savior, Jesus. We ask that you would bless the bread that we're about to partake. 
Lord, we're humbled by the sacrifice of your body, body who, which hung on a cross. As you graciously left the heavenlies to dwell among your creation, only to be betrayed by one of your disciples. And it was there on the cross of Calvary that you bore the sin of humanity. It was there that dealt, uh, fe- uh, death was dealt with fully. But Lord, we rejoice this morning as a family in celebrating that the story doesn't end there. But that triumphantly after your death, you were raised bodily to return to the presence of the Father. And just as you've come once, you're going to come again to return for us. Lord, we also ask that you would bless the cup that will we're about to partake in may we be reminded that without the shedding of your son's blood there would have been no remission of sin Lord we have been justified by the shedding of your blood you and only you could declare us righteous and you have it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray amen Terry, Roy.
After the last meals, uh, the last meal with the disciples and Jesus, it, uh, it didn't end in prayer. Uh, there was no further teaching. They simply sang a hymn and they went out. And so instead of singing a hymn this morning, we're actually, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're actually going to read our benediction together uh, as we publicly profess and encourage one another that the word of God is the truth of God. Read it along with me. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 through 39. This is the word of God for the people of God. See, oh, I need to apologize for my comment about Arkansas women. Accept my apology. It was a poor joke. Forgive me. Have a great week. Love you. <laughs>